Good day, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. This session will begin at the top of the hour. Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. I'm your host, Mike Lasecki, speaking to you from the Maricopa Community Colleges in Phoenix, Arizona. This webinar is being recorded. Welcome to Show Me the Money, Is Revenue Generation Possible for Grant-Funded Projects? Brought to you by ATE Central. It's my pleasure now to start introducing our presenters. Let me start with Rachel Bauer. Rachel is the PI of ATE Central, headquartered at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Welcome, Rachel. Would you come on and say hello to everyone, and then please introduce your colleagues. Thanks so much, Mike. I'm thrilled to be here, as always. Um, we have a great uh, webinar for, for everybody today, and I'm really happy to be here with um, our, our uh, primary presenter, Nancy Marin. Nancy, do you want to just say hello really quick? Hi, folks. Glad to be here today. And we have a special guest who's going to uh, share some of his own experiences uh, in terms of revenue generation and thinking about this whole topic um, as it relates to sustainability, Casey O'Brien. Casey, do you want to say hi really quick also so people can hear your voice and then you'll, you'll introduce yourself in just a bit too? Sure. Hi, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Fabulous. So, um, uh, as Mike said, I'm the PI of AT Central, which is an, a grant-funded uh, AT project, but now that the three of us have introduced ourselves, we wanted to just hear a little bit about you, and this is a good opportunity to practice the polling here too. So we just want to hear how you would, how you think about yourself. Are you affiliated with an ATE grant, affiliated with a TAC grant, maybe not funded at the moment, but writing an ATE proposal or other? And if you you type other, this gives you an opportunity to also practice um, in our chat window because that's the way you're going to be asking questions today. So. Up in the right-hand corner, you should see <clears throat> a chat box. Somebody is actually typing right now. And if you clicked on other, which five of you did, if you could just tell us a little bit. Of, somebody just said they're a grant wannabe, so they're thinking about writing a grant. Uh, anybody else who'd care to share information about who they are? Maybe you're an evaluator or something else. And it looks like we have a really nice range of folks with us today, Nancy. Yeah, Most you know, of the folks are... Go ahead. We've noticed that we have, you know, when we first started doing this, it was zeroed in on just ATE, but we have been thrilled to see that really a lot of the things we talk about are relevant to folks uh, in various funding streams and even to people just thinking about it. So really happy to see we have some folks with us who are just in that early planning stage. Yeah, absolutely. So somebody just uh, typed in the chat that they, they are a grant director and they're considering an AT project. So Hopefully this will give you a little bit more information about um, ATE and, um, and how to think about sustainability if you decide to move ahead with that. And there will be, um, it, John, you had asked if there would be a slide deck. You'll, we'll, we'll send you, um, Maytech will send a, a follow-up email to everybody and it'll have a link to the recording and the slides. So you'll, you'll definitely be able to get that. Um, yes, yeah, another faculty person who's considering writing grants. So that's great. All right, so Mike, if you can close this poll. Oh, he did that, great. All right, moving along. So just as a reminder, since some of you may be a little less familiar with ATE, ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. It's a National Science Foundation funding stream. And it's really NSF's only program that focuses so much on technical education, professional development, and specifically at, um, you know, th these um, projects and centers are mostly based at community colleges. There are um, always around 250 to 300 projects and centers nationally, depending on the funding cycle, who's, who's been funded and what year it is. Um, and one of the things we really like to stress about ATE is that it's not just a funding program. It's really a community, and it, 
It truly feels like a community of people who help each other and support each other. Um, and one of the ways that happens in ATE is that there are a lot of these cross-cutting um, projects and centers that are really being funded to help support folks, other grantees uh, uh, and PIs and staff. Um, one of those is, is my own project, AT Central. We're really here to help um, amplify the impact of AT, to try to support the work of projects and centers, to archive the resources that they develop, and, and to think about creating tools and services that are really responsive to community needs. Um, one of those being <clears throat> the idea of the sustainability support. We do lots of polling of the community, interviews and surveys to find out what the community really feels like they're struggling with or challenges uh, in areas that they, they'd like more information. And, and sustainability has come up consistently since we first started working with AT grantees. And so we, we um, found uh, Nancy through our, a relationship with Ithaca, an organization she's going to talk to you a little bit about. And Nancy has really um, come on board to help us sort of think about and strategize with projects and centers about how they're dealing with sustainability and and work with us because of her own experience in, in dealing uh, with others in this area, not just in the ATE community, but beyond ATE. And of course, we have expertise in the community. Casey is a great example of that. He's somebody who has a lot of experience um, thinking about sustainability and sustaining his own large center. So I'm going to turn it over to Nancy now, who's going to talk to you a little bit about Ithaca and her own work. Hey, thanks, Rachel. Um, as always, thrilled to be here and talking about um, such an important topic with this community. Ithaca, if you haven't heard of it before, is a not-for-profit that really works at the intersection of higher education and technology questions. You may have heard of JSTOR. Many um, institutions of higher learning subscribe to it. It's a big collection of journal content, book content, and even primary sources. Portico is a a little bit uh, more of a niche product, but that helps folks with digital preservation. And then Ithaca SNR, where I worked for several years as the Director of Sustainability and Scholarly Communications, is really a consulting group. And what's kind of interesting about that is that it itself was a bit of a spin-off from JSTOR, when in fact the folks who created JSTOR realized that the expertise they had accumulated in developing the first really large-scale content database for these journals had, uh, had made them valuable to other people in the community, so they started consulting. So in fact, Ithaca SNR, in a sense, was a bit of a revenue generating strategy for, for JSTOR at a certain point in the, uh, in, the, in the history of this organization. So today, I am actually no longer with Ithaca, but I'm on my own. I have spun myself out into another entity called Blue Sky to Blueprint, which is a consultancy. I work with uh, project leaders of digital initiatives and all kinds of innovative initiatives mostly in higher education, to think about what good business strategies would be. And, and that takes lots of different forms, revenue generation being one of them. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what this whole series is, though, because today we're talking about revenue generation, but it's in this framework of thinking like an entrepreneur, meaning that even if at the end of the day, you did not get a project grant or a center grant in order to be a, a web entrepreneur or an entrepreneur necessarily. Um, the logic of how you might think opportunistically, proactively, and, and, very, uh, and very quick in, in an environment that is constantly changing is quite similar to the way entrepreneurs would be thinking and acting. And um, the project leaders, and particularly center leaders who have been in this for a while, I think would agree. So the series we put together really zeroes in on some of these business strategies. And this slide is my excuse to remind folks that if you have not joined us for the first two in the series, we've archived them and they are available on the ATE uh, center website, central website. So the first one dealt with audience issues and particularly partnerships with industry. And the second, which was just last month, had to do with post-institutional support. So um, both of those really, really interesting. Um, I should also mention that not just this season, but other seasons are archived on that website as well. So there's a wealth of information, and I encourage you to go there and enjoy it. But today's 
webinar is going to take a very particular slant on this. And it's a, maybe an acquired taste for some, but I, but I hope you'll all find it quite interesting. Um, today, we're really going to zero in and talk a bit about what the role is of revenue generation when you're thinking about sustaining your ATE projects and centers. And I will admit that the title was um, a bit of a trick question. Is revenue generation possible? Yes, we would like to argue right up at the front that indeed it is. And the tougher question is what level of revenue generation and what types of gener revenue generation might be most appropriate. So we're going to get into some of the details with you this hour. In order to do that, we'll talk a little bit about sustainability in general, but then we're really going to be presenting a framework so that you can think about your project, the work that you've developed, and how to identify the elements in that that might be right for revenue generating ideas. But the really fun part of these webinars, particularly this season, is that we're going to turn over most of the time we have together so that we can offer you the perspective of someone who's actually doing this and has been doing this for many, many years. So, um, you know, the fact is that um, one of the tactics that you will probably hear me say several times during this, uh, during this hour, hour and a half, is that um, you always want to see what other folks are doing just so you can learn from those examples. And we are very, very pleased to have with us today Casey O'Brien, who is going to be telling us a bit about the work he's done on behalf of the National Cyber Watch Center. Um, I'm going to turn things over to him and let him actually introduce his work to you first. Um, then we'll go, we'll do an overview that I will lead, and then we're going to come back together with some questions and answers. But I will just say that what's interesting about, about Casey and what I hope you keep an ear open to during the time we have together is not just what he's achieved and the, the models he's experimented with, but just how many different avenues he's tested with this group and how he thinks about what things are worth testing and which things, uh, he, you know, how you decide which things to do and which things not to do. So with that as an intro, Casey, I will turn things over to you. Thanks, Nancy. Hi, everybody. Um, so I am the Executive Director and Principal Investigator of the National Cyber Watch Center, headquartered at Prince George's Community College, um, which is in Largo, Maryland, which is um, about 10 miles due east of the White House, the part of the state where, uh, sorry, part of the country, I should say, where Maryland, Northern Virginia, and D.C. kind of converge. I've been involved with um, the National Cyber Watch Center since its inception in 2005, back when we were called Cyber Watch, when Watch was an acronym for Washington Area Technician and Consortium Headquarters. And our whole focus starting in 2005 was to build the information security capacity in this country um, by making sure we had sufficient number of technicians moving into jobs and with the right kinds of skills. And that meant developing curricula, which really did not exist in 2005. There were maybe two or three programs in the entire country at both the two and four year level that had anything in the way of information security or what we call back then information assurance curriculum. Um, and we focused on faculty professional development, so train the trainer sessions, webinars, much like what we're doing today and um, various other ways to bring educators together and get them up to speed to be able to teach information security. We developed a strong K-12 program. Um, did a lot in the um, cybersecurity competition space. And um, and our footprint started to grow um, over over the course of seven years and through successive um, National Science Foundation advanced technological education funding. And the Washington Area Technician and Consortium Headquarters um, moniker really wasn't appropriate anymore as we as we started partnering with other ATE centers. In, throughout the country and bringing on academic member institutions outside the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. In 2012, we became the national center within the National Science Foundation ATE program. So there's typically one national center in each of the technological disciplines. And as such, really our main focus is to, is to 
be a voice for community colleges in cybersecurity education and workforce development. Um, we've developed a number of programs and provide resources both to two and four year schools. I mentioned academic member institutions, so we, um, we have about 200 two and four year schools throughout the country that are academic member institutions of National Cyber Watch. We have about 50 industry and state and local government agencies that are also members of our center. Um, we've launched uh, the Community College Cyber Summit now in its fourth year. Um, this year it's at actually at Prince George's Community College in National Harbor, June 28th through 30th. The previous years we partnered with the Community College of Allegheny County in Pittsburgh and the College of Southern Nevada in Las Vegas and Moraine Valley Community College in Palos Hills, Illinois to have a conference focused exclusively on information security educators. Um, we've done a lot in our 12-year history with um, not only curriculum development, so um, hands-on lab exercises, virtual machines to support the delivery of hands-on learning, um, e-books, um, assessment quest questions, videos, you name it, all the kind of wraparound and structural content, but also we have a lot of experience in building face-to-face -face and virtual lab environments to facilitate the the hands-on learning of information security. And in August, we launched a, a private cloud-based hosted lab solution with content that um, schools can leverage without having to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in racks of gear and equipment. Um, we produce a number of white papers and reports through our digital press. Um, we've launched um, in January, the Innovations in Cybersecurity Education, it's our awards and recognition program. And we're going to have our first round of awardees at the Community College Cyber Summit this, this June. Uh, and that's a way to capture models of excellence or effective models, effective programs, and then be able to, to, to share that with the community. It also allows us to identify new talent within our community. We launched the National Cybersecurity Student Association in April 2016. Um, we've got a growing assessment portfolio, and we do a lot in, in cybersecurity exercises, namely the Mid-Atlantic Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition as part of the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. That's been going on since 2005, and we've been involved with that from the beginning, and then um, we launched the National Cyber League in, um, in 2011. So those are some of our programs and resources and challenges. And this slide's just showing, in terms of kind of our focus moving forward, some of the challenges that, that, we, wanna, that we wanna tackle. And that is moving beyond a singular focus on knowledge. Um, in the information security professional space, um, professional certifications are a big deal. Many jobs require some sort of a professional certification, and there are there are lots of professional certifications for people at various levels professionally, from entry level to advanced, from technical to managerial and administrative to uh, to C level executives, uh, and most of those. Almost all of those, excluding a couple, are are of the knowledge base variety, and we see an opportunity really to develop not only standards around performance based assessments, but moving beyond just this focus on knowledge um, and being able to to demonstrate um, actions that lead to effective performance and being able to do things like figure out which skills made the difference in an employee getting a job or in them being able to effectively do their job. And you can see here some of the other approaches that we want to employ. We do a lot with simulation environments, gaming environments, um, and those allow us to scale, um, really, um, and, and not only scale, but pay on demand and you pay for usage and also allow us to do interesting things with assessment and capturing um, user behavior. So you can see some of the ways in which we want to solve these challenges, accelerated learning programs. We have a huge demand for information security talent in this country, actually even worldwide. The demand numbers are 
I think perhaps maybe um, a bit inflated, but um, I think most reasonable people would agree that there is a huge demand for information security talent both nationally and, in, and internationally, and, um, and not a lot of um, supply-side solutions. And so we don't have a lot of time to develop people, um, right? And so how do you accelerate um, a learning? How do you accelerate learning? How do you develop learning programs that can identify somebody on a learning curve and then accelerate that? Um, and we do that with some practice-based education programs. Um, we're developing some of the first curriculum standards for cybersecurity education that are focused on um, instructional design, um, skill practice facilities um, mapped to job performance models and national frameworks um, that are being helped shape by organizations like National Cyber Watch working in conjunction with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, developing some novel solutions to to rapidly um, create and customize and adapt curriculum. That's a huge challenge in our space is just people who not only are subject matter experts in a specific portion of information security, but um, but actually can then create content. So and then last but not least, looking at some formative credentialing solutions. So a little, a little background about us. There's my contact information, and I'll turn it over to, I guess, back to Nancy or Rachel. All right. Well, thank you so much, Casey. Um, we have an, a second poll question for everybody because we'd like to sort of have you tell us a little bit um, to what extent your project or center or, or whatever grant-funded um, work you're doing depends on generating funds aside from your actual uh, grant. So let's see, here we go. Mike's just opening that poll up for us. Okay, so the first answer obviously is that you aren't seeking additional sources of revenue at the moment. Um, maybe you get some additional revenue, but it's small. And uh, maybe even you generate substantial revenue. And then other, and again, if you, if you, um, clicked on other, a couple of you did, if you'd like to tell us uh, about that in the chat window. And I also wanted to mention too that, you know, as we're going along, um, please, any questions you have for Casey or Nancy, pop into that chat window and I'll try to, to get, um, make sure those are highlighted. All right, so folks are filling this out. So I'd like to we mention, have 50... what's, yep, what's that, Rachel? We have no, no, go ahead. Yep. Um, so I was going to just say that, um, you know, on this, it looks like most people who answered the poll are not currently seeking additional sources of revenue. And I'm guessing that obviously this is, hopefully this webinar is a way to just kind of get the gears turning. But I am also awfully curious to know kind of ATE wide, um, how many folks have, have ever tried it. And it's because uh, it, it, I'd be curious to know. Um, my guess is that it's not a huge number. Uh, but um, I think one of the interesting things, and I'm, I'm sure if other folks don't ask Casey, I'll make sure the question comes up, but um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the reasons that it might be beneficial and also the challenges that, uh, that it can pose, some of which may be it's, the reasons you're not trying it right now. It's interesting, though. We did have someone said that they provide curriculum design and, and development service. So somebody who, who clicked on other looks like they said that, and um, somebody else just said that they don't currently have NSF funding. There was a question that came up about something called UBIT, which I have to admit I'm not familiar with. Um, maybe this is a question for Casey. Looks like maybe it's unrelated business income tax, unrealted. I can't. Yeah. Does, is anyone familiar with that? We have, we have that some. Something? Yeah, we have some experience as it relates. Yeah. To, I mentioned the National Cyber League. So the National Cyber League is a project that got spun out of the National Cyber Watch Center, um, and and it became a um, a five hundred one c three so a tax, IRS tax exempt nonprofit um, about geez maybe. I don't know, four months ago. Prior to that, it was 
it was an incorporated entity in the state of Maryland um, as a non-stock nonprofit, and you have about three years of generating revenue as a nonprofit before you actually have to file for um, some IRS tax exempt status, and there are 501c varieties, and there are things you can do with certain 501c's that you can't do with others. Some you can lobby, some you can't. Um, and the gist with um, unrelated business income is that a nonprofit can make money on things not related to its mission. Um, so, for example, we could you could sell insurance to your members. Um, but the catch with unrelated business income is that the IRS can come in and tax that. So hopefully that helps answer that. Thank you so much. And Mike, you can close that poll question. I think we can. Thank you so much, Casey, for that information. Terrific. And Turn it back over to you, Nance. Yeah, and I'll also um, give a little shout out to, I think we have Deidre Sullivan uh, joining us on this webinar, at least in, in the list of participants. And Deidre was our guest last year and uh, had a wonderful um, webinar on this topic, which I'm guessing is also archived <laughs> along with the others. So um, just a little shout out to another great PI who does very interesting things with revenue generation as well. So let's take a little bit of a look. Here's the framework I was telling you about, but we'll start with just reminding folks um, about the big picture and where this fits. So when we talk about sustainability, it can kind of get a bad rap. The word itself makes it sound as though we're just kind of trying to keep everything steady and just not fall off a cliff. And actually, I always like to remind folks that we're looking at a more dynamic definition um, of what sustainability is. And Arguably, it's a bit of an uphill battle to change a word's definition. It's not necessarily our job to do that. But the nuance here is we're looking for um, a plan or a strategy that will help you not just to, to make money, right, but to identify what all the resources you're going to be needing going forward um, that will help you to continue to build and grow your work so that it, continue, it can continue to deliver value to the people that you're doing it for. And so the sustainability plan, when you think about it, uh, is not just kind of like a one-shot business plan that gets filed in a drawer, but it's really, it's the description of this logic. And the logic is based in evidence, real, real world, this is working, this is not working, um, to understand what those values are, uh, what the values are that you deliver to the people that you engage with, and in exchange, what they give back to you. So sometimes they might give you things that are their time and attention, and sometimes those things might be cash or other forms of funding. So think about it as a big cycle. And here's another way we look at it. So you'll see where revenue fits in to the suite of activities you might undertake if you were going to develop your own holistic sustainability plan. When you write your grant proposal, um, you have arguably a great idea. Otherwise, surely you wouldn't have gotten that far. But there's a lot of other forces that act on that raw, great idea that help shape it. And uh, this happens over time, over the proposal writing, but really over the years of running these projects and centers. So if you look at the top of this little diagram, you first have a piece of work to do when you're thinking about, gee, you know, what do my users need? What do faculty need from this initiative, what do students need, what do my um, business and industry partners need. So that's the audience piece. The environment piece is who else is already out there doing something like what I'm doing? So are my users actually going someplace else right now? And if, if they are, how is what I'm about to do going to be really different and really uh, transformational for them so that they come to me instead? So those are the kinds of external forces that are going to help shape this raw idea into a really strong value proposition uh, back to that audience. And I can already hear in the way, I don't know if you've all noticed it too, but even in the way Casey's talking about it, the ideas that he's pushed forward for revenue generation are always grounded in his observation of a user demand and what the demand is. And in his case, he mentioned something already about industry partners and what they need from students coming out of these programs. So that helps him shape this into a, into a stronger idea. Now as you go down this cute little chart, uh, you see a bunch of ways that you operationalize all that. 
You establish ambitious goals that are measurable and hopefully attainable. You figure out the set of activities you're going to need to do every year to keep delivering on those goals. And then a little bit less fun, but the reality sets in, you'll have things that cost money and you'll have to find ways to pay for them. And so that's essentially what this, what this logic model looks like and what the flow looks like starting from setting very ambitious goals that are based in what you want to deliver and ending with the question of what is it going to cost me, what am I going to need, and where am I going to get those sources from? So, but do you really have to generate money? <laughs> um, it's really not the first thing anyone wakes up thinking they want to do if they're in a grant-funded project because mostly, hopefully, you won't have to. But it depends, right? It will depend on when you've done the assessment of the costs and the expenses you're going to want to incur to do something great, you might end up figuring out that you will need to make something additional beyond that. There are other benefits as well that Casey and Deidre and others can speak to, which is that it can provide some needed flexibility uh, with your ability to um, you know, generate the funds and, and reinvest them in the way that you would like to. And then finally, uh, the ultimate thing is looking forward to a potential world, potentially post-grant, um, you know, how might you run this if there weren't a grant? You've created something wonderful. Uh, it's run an important course, but for whatever reason, funding doesn't exist or doesn't exist at the level that you would need it. Is there a way that you can come up with a way to continue to make funds so that you continue to, to do this good work? Here's another way to look at your options. We, we're not doing a cost unit right now, but if we were, you might start by thinking about what is the whole list of every kind of resource, every kind of input I'm going to need in order to deliver what I'm doing. Probably have something around project management and leadership, maybe something around IT development, certainly something around content creation and event planning, all of the, the programming that you do, outreach and promotion. There's a whole list, and then certainly it could be longer than this. But a first step might be just sketching out what it is. A next step I would suggest is, you know, if you were doing a traditional budget, you might, um, you might just ask, what do I have to pay for out of pocket? When I work with folks, we, I tend to encourage people to think about every possible cost, and then we just look at what they've got to pay. And so when you do that, you might figure out that some of the things will be covered elsewhere. If you look at that middle column, we talked about this last month, your institution may be offering you all kinds of support in kind. For example, legal guidance, financial guidance or accounting, payroll, whatever, probably even your office space. For other kinds of projects, you get huge value for things like content creation that are coming from effectively volunteers. You know, if they're faculty and students who may be doing it because they just want to be part of the community, that's, that's often a big benefit. But if you don't get lucky and if you can't put everything into the second and third columns, almost certainly you're going to find some stuff in that first column, meaning you're going to actually have to pay for it. And so whereas in-kind support will require a really robust strategy for managing your host institution and those partners, volunteer labor is really going to require a robust strategy for managing your audience and increasing uh, volunteer activity. If you're paying out of pocket, you may need a strategy to generate revenue. So before I go on, are there any questions? I'll, I'll keep an eye on the window, but um, feel free to type things in if, if questions arise. I'm going to share a framework with you that's really intended as a bit of a brainstorm. So I'm going to offer some idea of ways you could do this, and then I'll give you some examples of what different funding models could be. Um, this work that I'm about to share is actually available in a report that I did uh, with Ithaca SNR, which is called, quite immodestly, A Guide to the Best Revenue Models. Who knows if they're the best revenue models, but at very least, it's a guide for you to figure out the ones that are best for you. So the logic of this framework is that, you know, it's a little bit too easy to think, wow, we've got to generate funds. Uh, 
you know, someone over there I heard of is doing this cool thing. Maybe we can do it too. There's nothing wrong with looking to, from side to side. In fact, I, I always encourage that as, as a tactic. But what I'd like to encourage folks to do here is without prejudice, think about the values that your own initiative has generated. You've developed this over time, possibly over many years. Arguably, there are some pretty wonderful things that you've generated over time. Let's take a look category by category and see what kinds of revenue models might be possible. The categories we can look at are everything from the content you've developed, the tools and services, to the audience itself and the people and the relationships to the mission. So let's take a look at, at how that can work. When we're talking about content, what do we really mean? Here that could be um, you know, really anything. It can be a curriculum you've developed. It can be the content of a program or like an event that you host. But the key question when you're thinking about is this valuable enough could there be something here? Is, is there something really unique about this content? Is it unique? Is it one of a kind? Is it difficult to find anyplace else? Another key question is, you know, not an insignificant question, is there an audience for this? Do, are there people here who really, really need this content that I've created? And then Kind of a secondary question, but is this a one-shot kind of a piece of content, or is this going to be constantly updated, constantly fresh? So if you think about that and you come to the conclusion that, yeah, we've really created some good stuff, here are some possible models that can work. So one thing that you, I'm sure you've all been become familiar with are subscription models, right? If there is some kind of content that you've got, you're going to continue to update it very much like a journal model, it's, it's possible that you could have people subscribe to that stream of material. Um, that's one possibility. You could have folks purchase that material outright or purchase perpetual access to it if it's living on a website. You could have other forms of payments, for example, a pay per use some kind of a metered payment. Or you could go a different way and license it so people have the right to use it. They may not own it, but they certainly have access to it. And then in the content world, there's also this idea that, you know, maybe one layer of it is freely available to everyone, but there's some other kind of special value add that you end up charging for. So I'll briefly highlight a couple of examples here, but then actually we're going to get Casey back on to tell us about his experience with one of these content-based models. So the subscription example we see in a lot of online databases and journals, often the purchase model, or even now these days people are renting textbooks, um, but this purchase model and, is, and this transaction model is more like what you would see with textbooks or robotics kits and or admission to events, things like that. There's all kinds of licensing options where you could potentially, um, again, like access information for a time. And then there's other interesting examples which I won't go into as much now but unless people uh, are specifically interested in it, but this idea of something with the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, for example, where the content is freely available online, but if you'd like to see it in a different format, for example, paginated and laid out a certain way with PDFs in PDF, that you actually have to pay for. So that's just a bit of the flavor. But Casey, can you tell us a bit about your experience with the textbook that you developed? So, yeah, Nancy, um, so there was a question too, and this is, a, I think, a good segue about so much of the curricular or instructional materials are free as open educational resources. And the question was, doesn't that limit our market for our materials? Uh, and I'm not sure it limits the market as much as I've, I've found that um, oftentimes, um, sustainability models for open educational resources are oftentimes non-existent or oftentimes I've also heard of instances where um, perhaps this is true at my college um, Prince George's Community College for a um, for a course that had hundreds of sections 
they partnered with the publisher and, and those materials were open educational resource materials, you know, of some sort of um, um, either um, Creative Commons license or using some sort of a GNU public license for those that are familiar with free and open software. software. And then at some point the publisher decided um, they had a huge market for this and that they were going to start charging. Um, and so it becomes very difficult to keep the, the instructional content up to date. And I know that was the case with, with CyberWatch. We started creating content in 2006 and all the content that we created and any content that we currently create that's paid for with National Science Foundation funding um, does get some sort of a, is free and open source to the community as part of the, of the federal funding. And we've, we've adopted a Creative Commons for some material and a, and a, a GNU um, a public license for other, um, but the challenge again is just how do you keep that content fresh um, and how do you keep it current and it becomes very difficult. So we settled on a different model which is we will we will um, we'll, we'll make certain content available for free and then um, we can package that same content but deliver it in a different way, right? We can deliver it in a hosted cloud-based lab environment with assessment questions that we write and um, and associated virtual machines and deliver an entire experience um, and monetize that and charge an access code, $80 per access code per student per course, for example. And that access code is good for six months and students can use that access code then to to access our hosted lab environment, typically through integration with the school's learning management system. So they log into the LMS and then from the LMS, the instructor has set up links to our hosted lab environment and specific lab exercises. And as long as we attribute the lab exercise content uh, right, using the proper attributes attribution methods, right, if it's a Creative Commons license, we can, you can package that and anybody can package that. In fact, anybody can take any of the open education resources that are produced and package those and deliver those in a novel way and monetize those. Um, and so that's, that's one of the ways we've been able to continue to provide quote unquote open educational resource materials for the community, but, but also then be able to package and deliver that um, in a much richer experience and be able to monetize that. Um, we've also had experience partnering with a publisher on the creation of ebooks. So we wanted to uh, create an all digital solution um, to address some of the challenges that we were facing with being able to keep content current especially in fast-moving fields like IT and information security. And so an all digital solution, ebooks and Right and and assessment questions and uh, lecture slides and hands-on lab exercises that are all digital was attractive, um, and so we were able to partner with with the publisher and in some cases create um, new books from scratch. In other cases, take um, existing existing books from the publisher's catalog and reskin them with the National Cyber Watch skin, if you will. Um, and, and in other cases, we would take existing books and make no editorial changes or technical changes whatsoever. Um, and so um, in that case, the publisher owns the intellectual property, uh, and then we work with a third-party distributor to distribute those e-books, and National CyberWatch gets a royalty of every e-book sold. Um, and so you can generate a little bit of revenue that way as well. Um, Casey, Marilyn just asked that, she said she was under the impression that if content was developed with federal grant funds that the content had to be provided shared at no cost. It does, it does, and we do. So um, any new content that we develop um, does have to be shared at no cost, and and we do. Um, we we make um, lab. At, we actually partner with the Center for System Security and Information Assurance at Moraine Valley Community College, and they they're the quote unquote distributor of the free labs themselves. So anybody that wants to get good quality hands-on information security lab exercises, 
we make those labs available for, for free at CASSIA, that's C-S-S-I-A dot org. Um, and in fact, we've also, were able to partner with Microsoft, um, partners are the wrong word, we were able to work out a deal with Microsoft um, a number of years ago to make the sharing of the associated virtual machines that are used with those lab exercises um, with academic institutions. So what that means is for those that are not familiar, um, so virtual machines allow us to take a computer with an operating system and various software tools on it and make that computer available in software. And so it allows us to create networks of hundreds or thousands of, of systems and be able to then provide those systems to faculty and students to work on. Um, and, uh, and so the lab exercises we write in and of themselves oftentimes need some sort of software. And so technically all we have to make available is the lab exercise itself, um, but we oftentimes will develop these virtual machines with the necessary software on it that support the hands-on lab exercises. The challenge is, is up until partnering or working on an agreement with Microsoft is, is that um, Microsoft software is copyrighted and I'm not allowed to, if I, if I have a license for some version of say Windows 8.1 and I create a virtual machine for Windows 8.1, I can't, tr I can't make that virtual machine available to academic institutions, um, even though it's needed to support the hands-on lab we wrote because of copyright issues, because I paid for a license of that Microsoft operating system and or, and or any of the Microsoft tools on it. And so the, the agreement that Microsoft um, inked with us was to uh, allow us to share virtual machine, Microsoft virtual machines with academic institutions that have what's called, it used to be the Microsoft Developer Network Academic Alliance, which for all intents and purposes is a fancy term for volume license. So if you're at, you know, if you're at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and you want to install some flavor of Windows on hundreds of thousands of computers throughout the campus in various labs, typically you'll buy a volume license. Um, that program's since been renamed DreamSpark, and so as long as an academic institution has a DreamSpark license, then we can also share the Microsoft virtual machines with the labs. And somebody asked, what's the link for that? And it's, it's Cassia.org. And um, give me a second. If you go to cassia.org, across the top, then you want resources. And then you'll see the various labs that are available. Um, so, and we make those available. But here's the thing. Anybody can take those labs. Back to Marilyn Lynch's question. Anybody can take those labs. Those labs have been, um, they have Creative Commons and or other various, if you will, kind of open source type licenses on them for the content itself. And they say who paid for the lab. In some cases, it was Department of Labor money that paid for those labs. In other cases, it was National Science Foundation ATE money. And so those labs will be, will have that content. Um, it, it, the content will have the appropriate um, funding source and, and the appropriate um, um, intellectual property or licensing on it. Um, but sent because it was paid for using federal funds, they're in the public domain. And there's nothing in either the Creative Commons or the GNU public licenses that say somebody can't take that, repurpose it, package it, and deliver it in a different way commercially as right. long as they provide proper attribution for that content. This is exactly how the free and open source software um, market works. There's something called the Linux kernel, which is the, the core software that supports the Linux operating system. And any anybody can take that Linux kernel and modify it and change it and package it and sell it as long as they do some proper attribution of that original software. And you have a whole companies that were developed under that model. Red Hat, for example, SUSE are good examples, so.
Yeah, and so I mean, the the takeaway here is that um, when we even here talk about revenue generation, we're not um, we're certainly not looking to go afoul of any obligations. What gets very interesting is trying to think about what those I don't, you know people used to call it freemium, but those free plus premium, um, free plus value added. Um, model can be. So the example that Casey just outlined is the, the materials are there, the labs are freely available, uh, but the environment in this case might be something that's extra and that's worth, that will be worth uh, folks paying for to use. So that's, that's a great example. And um, let's move on if that's okay. And we're going to, I'm going to keep coming back to you, Casey, <laughs> so you can keep jumping in. Um, Another area is tools and services, and actually I may have used your lab example here, but the logic is that you may have actually created an environment as part of what you're doing. It might be you know, a software platform, it can be tools, uh, things like that, that are actually quite valuable. Um, or it might just be the expertise you've accumulated, and that turns out to be something that you can, uh, that you can consider for revenue generation. So the question you may want to ask yourself is, Again, are the tools and features that I've created in this work uh, valuable enough to pay for? And again, is there an audience out there who would care about it? Possibly, do I have staff now who have become so expert at creating curriculum, developing assessments, uh, thinking about standards, that other people are going to come to us and ask us to do the work for them? So some of these models somewhat similar to the content models, but you still see a charge for added value um, coming up as an option. You know, some obvious examples are all of these, um, you know, web-based models where there's a very, very basic level that's, that's free for everybody. You can get in with very little obligation, but they'll start to charge for things depending on the intensity of your usage, the different feature sets that become activated when you start to pay, storage capacity, that sort of thing. So I just you know, jotted down SurveyMonkey as one example. Um, this online lab infrastructure is, is another kind of example. I may have gotten it a little bit wrong there, Casey, but the idea is that you, know, you have a logic that people will actually support because they find it's valuable even if some of the content that's living there itself is free. Um, there's other things like, um, dare I say, I believe the webinar services <laughs> that Maytag runs, which just became something that this team became extremely expert in, that becomes very valuable to others in the community. And then those of you who have come to my other events, you may know that I am a huge fan of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's citizen science project called eBird, where it's a huge database of birding observations. And you know what they do is they have developed um, a way to let others license their material and go off and, and do their own work with it. So maybe since Casey, I think we covered this already, well, I'll just jump to the next one, uh, unless you have something to add there. Let's go nope. to audience. So this is a little bit more challenging, and this, this next topic brings up some potentially thorny questions, but let's just dive in. You know, you've done the work, you've established relationships with faculty, with students, with partners, is that something you can leverage? If you think about um, the big world out there, there's lots of web-based companies that are doing a lot of leveraging when it comes to audience, uh, for better or worse. But it certainly is a, a provocative uh, thing to think about. So let's, let's look through this together. So some of the questions would be, is the work I'm doing and the audience that is participating in it valuable of, of a certain interest? to specific industries or specific companies? And without thinking too hard, for the AT community, the answer is yes, almost certainly. The next question is a little tricky. Is the audience going to be large enough to be appealing to these communities? Now, you may have to think about it. It may depend. But are there certain specific attributes about it that may supersede the size? It might not be a huge crowd, but it might be the exact right people that are in it. And finally, how, how good are you? And is your team at translating and measuring what these qualities and what this and the quantities are of these people in a way that will really resonate with potential uh, investors? So what kinds of models are we talking about? Here we're talking about uh, advertising and uh, corporate sponsorships. 
and these can take a bunch of different forms. I'll just I'll mention a couple. Uh, and if we were all sitting together in person, here's where people would start to get annoyed and throw things because who wants advertising? It seems so crass and awful. And um, especially in the academic space, uh, many people uh, respond negatively to that. The example I have here is of ENA, which is, an, is a, an acronym for the French Audiovisual National Archive, of all things. But I thought it was an interesting example because it's definitely in that kind of libraries and archive space, very kind of intellectually focused, but also very public. And I, there's a case study on the Ithaca website talking about this. They, for years, they had plenty of advertising. They had advertising because their public website drew so many users, it became valuable to, for companies to, to advertise there. And you know they needed to raise funds like everyone else did. Um, so that's, it was an, an option available to them. Corporate sponsorships get interesting. And this may be a kind of richer terrain for this organization to think about, or this kind of this community to think about. Um, when I think back to eBird, if I could just hark back uh, one more time to that, again, imagine this website that draws thousands and thousands of birding enthusiasts uh, really every day and really hardcore birders. Uh, at some point, they realized that there was a terrific link between what those birders were interested in and the audience that, oh, an optics company might want to reach. So indeed, eBird secured, at some point, uh, a corporate sponsorship agreement from Zeiss, the manufacturer of optics and lenses. And so that seems like a marriage made in heaven in that case. You know, it's, it's a very subtle uh, logo that sits on a website. It's right in front of all the people who need it. There's not a lot of interference and intertangled motives going on there. Very simple relationship. Another example, and this is one that Deidre shared with us last year, was at Nate, which is um, the Marine, um, oh Lord, I'm not going to remember the <laughs> exact acronym, but they do, uh, they sponsor the underwater robotics competition. Um, uh, you know, because of the uh, success of the events themselves, um, she has found over time that there are many, um, there are many corporate sponsors who really want to be a part of it. They want to support it because it's the right thing to do, but they also want their names there in front of the participants, meaning the teachers and the students who are there every year. So now, Casey, in this case, you had a different kind of sponsorship arrangement. I wonder uh, if you could just briefly tell us a little bit about what it looks like when you have these scouting reports and why they're valuable um, to, the, to the people who, uh, who invest in them. Sure. So, um... So as I mentioned, there's a huge demand for qualified talent, and so that's where the cybersecurity competitions come in. Um, as part of the Mid-Atlantic Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, which is one of 10 regions nationally that comprise this national competition, uh, and that's actually the Mid-Atlantic um, competition is this Friday and Saturday, and Thursday, so in two days, on the 30th is a job fair. We've got upwards between 15 and 20 companies, and these are companies like your various um, defense contractors, so BAE Systems, Raytheon, Lockheed, Northrop, um, Microsoft, cybersecurity companies like Tenable Network Security. Um, we'll get small companies and then federal agencies like the National Security Agency, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Department of Homeland Security, and they'll come for a, a half day and they'll do, they'll do a meet and greet and a, kind of your traditional job fair with students. And, and the main reason those entities um, pay to sponsor the Mid-Atlantic Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition is one, they get access to resumes. So they get 300 resumes. They get this weeks before the competition. Students, when they register for the event, choose to opt into this program. So it's not a requirement, but we get upwards of 95% participation rate. Um, and then these companies get these resumes prior to the job fair, and then they use the actual meet and greet at the job fair to to do some further uh, interviewing, some, and in often cases, some preliminary um, um, jobs um, offers are made on the spot and so there's the just the traditional kind of sponsorship package and you get a bunch of things you get a table you get to do the job fair you get resumes you get key speaker slots 
But we also have companies that aren't interested in that. They're simply disinterested in the resumes, or we have headhunters or talent acquisition folks or boutique cybersecurity talent um, acquisition companies that just want the resumes and they'll pay, it's, it's transaction based, they'll pay for these resumes um, and they'll pay X amount and that, that generates revenue for the National Cyber Watch Center um, and that, that's, what's, what, that's what's known as programmatic income in the NSF world, right? So where you have programs that are generating revenue um, and then we've negotiated something, me and my various program directors, where a, a, a portion of the, the revenues over expenses goes back into the program, and then the remaining portion comes to back to the mothership, if you will, um, comes back to National Cyberwatch, and that allows us then to have money to expand into new programs, new areas. Uh, the second kind of transaction oriented uh, product that we that we make available through the National Cyber League is a scouting report. Um, and if you go to nationalcyberleague.org, I'll post the URL in the in the chat window, there's a link at the top of the website for scouting reports. And what these are fundamentally are their performance based assessments. So the National Cyber League model is try to encourage, so work with faculty throughout the country to in integrate National Cyber League in the classroom. Well, what's that mean? It means we provide um, hands-on lab exercises in our virtual learning environments that faculty use as either supplemental homework um, or extra credit. So it's where you train, if you will. We call it the NCL gymnasiums, the National Cyber League gymnasiums. And that's where you go to develop knowledge and skills. And you get access to those environments 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then we align challenges in the quote unquote stadium where you go to compete. And those challenges are aligned with the hands-on lab exercises that we make available in the gym. And it's the scouting report is the byproduct of individuals competing in our events. And you can see samples of the scouting reports on our on our website in that URL I've, I've listed. And, and, and a, there's a couple of ways in which these are being used. So for non-monetary purposes, faculty and students use it to gauge strengths and weaknesses across a, a range of learning competencies. Um, they also use it to, faculty especially use it to gain strengths, to gauge strengths and weaknesses of their, of their curricula, their programs. Um, employers want access to these scouting reports because it's really one of the first performance-based assessments in the marketplace, especially in the information security market space where, you know, where there's really people are, are, are really craving um, some way to differentiate between those that can, that just know how to do something, right, versus those that can actually do it. Meaning, let me say it differently, differentiate between those that have simply just um, they pass, for example, a professional certification, um, right? They're good at taking a test, but perhaps they actually can't implement some solution. And these performance-based assessments are a way of the National Cyber League validating someone's not only knowledge, but skills across a set of predefined competencies. And so we partnered with Facebook the past two years in, in kind of an exclusive um, partnership, really exclusive in the sense that we wanted to test this notion. Um, and so Facebook would pay for the top 100 players in the country. So we have about 3,000 students from about 300 schools um, and working with about 300 educators throughout the country that, that participate in the National Cyber League in each fall and each spring semester. And so we're able, these scouting reports are able to be kind of sliced and diced however you want. So you can, you can a company like Facebook can say, give me the top 100 players overall. So give me the players who did well across a range of learning competencies. Um, or they could say, you know what, we really need people that are really good at web application stuff. So give us the top yeah. 50 players in web application or give us the top 25 players in the western part of the United States in log file analysis. And that's that's transaction oriented as well. Well, and that's interesting. I mean, like what would strike me as the, the kind of um, sensitive issue here would be, I mean, that's an awful lot of very personal information. But what you said right at the start was that uh, the students actually opt in 
right? And in a way, it's really like a very appealing way of getting their names to potential employers. Right? And, and is that summing it up? Sure. Yep, that's Actually. absolutely true. <laughs> because when when you first think about it, there's so much uh, so much uh, concern about how all this, you know, identifiable data is being is being used. But the fact is, um, this is like a great could be a great way for people to zero right in on on the potential employees that they like. So I thought that was a super interesting example, and I'm, I'm grateful you could share it with us. Let's just take a quick look at the last one. This is the easy one, everybody, because really, if you're on the call. Um, this is about you. I mean, you know, most folks who are looking at um, getting support for their work are doing it in this space, I mean, the academic space, because it's just fundamentally a good idea. The mission is really what drives all of us. Um, so the question then is who else feels the way we do, right? Is there a pool of like minded people who are going to support what we do just because it's the right thing to do and it, it aligns with their values as well? Um, if you're looking at donations, um, are there? Do you're going to do you have the ability to accept them? Because actually, sometimes the infrastructure around that is a little tricky. You need uh, to put ways to put out a call, ways to accept payments. Sometimes that is actually trickier than it sounds. And then um, when we think about other things, are you not just with aligning with funders, but um, how closely are you aligning with the aims of your host institution? Um, as we discussed last month, I mean, if you can find ways for the thing you do to be amplifying and supporting the thing that um, your president and provost want to be doing, um, that can unlock lots of kinds of support. So what are we talking about here? The first is like a membership model. You know, there are examples where uh, you may have an organization that delivers a terrific value to lots of other similar organizations, other colleges and, and universities, for example. And rather than having people pay in a transactional way for access to a piece of curriculum or this or that, you can have a membership model. People may contribute to the cause or for a specific slice of the cause because they acknowledge that, that you're doing a great job and they, they'd like to support it and they need the help. Um, in terms of philanthropy, that really is square on the kinds of grants, for example, that, um, that many of us typically apply for, and uh, obviously you want to be very well aware of what the direction of your funders is and where it is heading. People do seek individual donations. I'd be curious to hear from this group if anyone has, has tried that and how it's fared. Um, it's harder to do. Uh, it seems, looks easy, but it's not so easy. And then the last example in the philanthropy bucket is endowments, and that's super hard. But projects that are at a much, much bigger scale uh, have done this. Um, I'm not entirely sure if they've done it within the ATE community, but I can give you an example. So we're going to talk a little bit about the student memberships with Casey in a minute, but I'll just kind of share with you um, this endowment model, which is kind of a rare animal, but it's kind of interesting. And the, the logic there is if there was an initiative, there was this initiative and it still exists, this Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and to make sure that every year they didn't have to go out and kind of beat the bushes for subscribers or for people to support or for new grants, they went to a bunch of libraries and said for a one-time payment, if we can build up an endowment enough over a couple of years, the, uh, the interest from that uh, endowment will allow us to cover pretty much all of our operating costs to keep this running indefinitely. And, um, and that indeed is uh, is what they what they did. Uh, it doesn't work in many cases because you have to have a really really good pitch to make, and you have to have a sizable number of people to whom to make that pitch. But it's certainly an interesting logic, especially for for bigger scale organizations. In terms of host institution support, I'll mention Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy again because when their endowment model didn't entirely cover everything that they needed. They um, waged a charm offensive back to their host university of Stanford. Um, you know, and I say that lightly, but, but what they did was quite profound. They assembled a tremendous dossier of all of the great things they had accomplished. They literally talked about the articles that had been published as a result of their good work, 
the faculty prizes that had come as a result, the, um, the number of people engaged in volunteering their time for this work, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they, they went on and on, and they were able to make such a good case that they were able to unlock some host institution support in the form of a paid position that the university gave them to continue this project. So again, again, those who participated last month know full well, and those who have tried it, for sure, uh, host institution support doesn't come easy, but it's a, it's a wonderful thing if, if you can get it. So um, Casey, I'm looking at the clock. We don't have a lot of time, and there's still a lot of questions I would love to ask you, but could you tell us in maybe just a sentence or two a little bit about the student membership model that, that you were mentioning to me? Yeah, sure. So we what launched the national... Yeah, sorry, Nancy. We, we launched the National Cybersecurity Student Association in April of 2016. Excuse me, and um, and so that's a that's a basically a dues membership based organization. Right now, it's a project of the National Cyber Watch Center, um, but that's a perfect candidate for a legal entity uh, on its own. Right, it's a it'd be a perfect um, nonprofit. Right, well, it's a dues member organization, um, and so students pay twenty-five dollars for an annual membership, and they get certain rights and benefits. Uh, and the challenge with spinning off legal entities from your programs is to think about how the your program, so like in this case, the National Cyber Watch Center, could still share in some of that revenue. Um, and perhaps you do things like in the bylaws of the nonprofit organization, you write in a position on the board of the student association. It'll always be you know, somebody at Prince George's Community College with the National Cyber Watch, and perhaps a certain percentage of the revenue above expenditures goes back to support National Cyber Watch. That's it. That's terrific. Sorry, I muted myself to get out of the way there. So I hope folks have seen that there's this. There's this wide range of options. Um, just a reminder that, especially for those who are concerned about um, you know, being on the right side of open in, in this era, especially when federal funding guidelines uh, mandate it, of, this is a list of all of the models we've just talked about. And you know, there's only really two that are not compatible with, with open access. I just abbreviated it as OA. But essentially, unless you're literally putting content behind a paywall where people will not be able to get at it unless they pay you, uh, it is probably, there's a, probably a way to do it that is open access. And in Casey's examples of one flavor that's open and another flavor that has some value added is, was a great example of that. So um, we have a last poll question for everyone. All right, everybody. So um, we'd just like to hear from you quickly about your main challenges in seeking uh, revenue beyond your uh, federal or project or center dollars. Um, so Mike, could you pop open that poll for us? There it is. Um, so maybe you're just feeling like you're not sure which models or sources would work for you. Um, maybe you feel like your institutions has some rules that would make this difficult or your funder in fact, has rules that would make it difficult. Or as Nancy mentioned just previously, maybe you struggle with having a mechanism in place uh, at your institution that will allow you to accept payments or other. And if it's an other, again, if you could pop that info into the chat window. All right, so folks are answering here. And Well, that's interesting, Nancy. I wouldn't have expected the number one answer to be that their institution had rules that make it difficult. I mean, I guess it isn't surprising, but but I'm actually a little well, you know, surprised by that. I've heard all now that I see this, I'm thinking we have heard all kinds of things. Like um, I'm trying to think of who, which who it was. Not that I would say it on a public webinar anyway, but um, where there was an example of a place that actually wanted to accept donations and literally couldn't get the mechanics approved of accepting a credit card payment online, right? I mean, there are some things yeah. that are at what you would think would be a trivial level, but is not at all trivial. And then there's yeah, those really there's those deeper, deeper questions, which are things like, as, as Casey alluded to, um, and Deirdre, I still remember, spoke about um, quite passionately last year, um, there are obligations under the umbrella of the grants you have or will have that say if you generate program-related revenue under this 
uh, grant, you have to spend it before you continue, can continue to spend down the rest of your grant. In other words, it's not entirely off to the side. Um, it actually um, it doesn't kind of add to the pile. It just extends the time you have to spend down what you've got. So it's a, it's a little bit different kind of a flavor for, for why you would do it and um, leads to other questions about when you can actually spin something out into, into a separate project altogether. So, but I'm interested in this. I'm going to switch around because it's getting a little late here, but a lot of people said that they're not sure which are likely to work. And so what I'm going to do, Rachel, if that's okay with you, is I'm going to share my last two slides about steps people can take to start testing. Absolutely. Mike, why don't you close that poll for us and we can move ahead to that. And, and then we've gotten with, a lot of good information. Yeah. But, and then with the remaining time, I'm going to try to sneak in some more questions with Casey. But I want to make sure folks have um, a feeling for what they might be able to do to at least to get a feeling for what might be a good idea, what might be a lost cause. So the first step I'd like to encourage everyone to do is, uh, if you haven't already been kind of taking notes during this webinar, have a look at that report with a kind of a pad and pencil nearby or a brainstorm with your team and just list out the options you think you, you, may, you may have. Um, that's kind of obvious maybe, but kind of sometimes letting the creative juices flow on this is a very good idea not to shut down any possibilities before you've considered them. Um, the next step is to have a look at who else has tried this. Because it's not that you can't break new ground, but it's absolutely worth checking in with people who have had the experience so they can help offer you some shortcuts or to save you some heartbreak. <laughs> so Casey is a great example. Deirdre is a great example. There's a bunch of other, particularly the folks who are directing the, the centers who have tried an awful lot of methods. And I certainly encourage you to start there. However, you don't have to be constrained just to the AT community. You can look anywhere you see something similar going on, particularly in the academic not-for-profit world. You'd be amazed maybe at how willing people are to actually just talk to you about how things work. So I'd encourage people to do that. So what does the testing look like? In order for you to test something out, and we could actually do a whole session just on this, but I'll just highlight what these things would be. You want to actually start sketching out what your assumptions are. So let's say it's a membership model, and you say, I, you know, how many, the first question might be, how many members am I likely to have based on how many institutions fit this description? Um, that might be one assumption is that I'm not going to get 100%. My assumption might be I'll probably get half of them. You, know, you want to play around with what you think is out there. You want to also test your assumptions on, on why they would care. Your assumption might be people will become members because they actually find a huge value in the curriculum we produce. Well, you may want to go out there and start asking people and finding out how accurate your assumptions are. And that's going to be a really, really important first step is you know what what some folks might call you know the voice of the customer so figuring out what your potential participants in this revenue model actually think and would be willing to pay for once you have a, a hunch if this is heading in the right direction the next step even if it feels early is to sketch out what that first path budget looks like just for this revenue generating effort in a best case scenario and a more realistic scenario what are you likely to bring in if these things work? If you get this many people, if they're paying this much money, et cetera. But don't forget to do the other side of the spreadsheet as well and ask yourself the hard questions. What is it going to cost me to uh, deliver this? You might have to hire someone to do another job in order to get this done. You might have to revamp a website or hire a designer. Whatever it is, it may not be uh, unsurmountable, but you do have to figure out what those are. So that's another step. And then finally, start testing. That could look like, again, going into the field and pretending you're actually trying to sell this or pitch this to someone with a very specific idea of what it is and start to get some feedback about what that looks like. Just doing that piece of groundwork is going to help you fairly quickly uh, get a sense of, of which ideas are likely to fly and which you might want to either go back to the drawing board or, or leave off the drawing board altogether. Um, Rachel, did you have something you wanted to add before I maybe ask Casey a closing question? 
You know, I think one of the things that um, came up, someone actually asked about MOOCs, and I don't know, Casey, if you have any experience. It's a little, it's it's taking us in a slightly different direction, but I did want to make sure that we asked, or Nancy, if you had anyone when you were doing the case studies who who dealt with MOOCs as a way to um, generate revenue. Yeah, Rachel, we haven't done a lot with MOOCs. Um, I mean, we certainly have done a lot with with scalable, massively scalable, um, and open virtual learning environments, which is fundamentally really kind of the MOOC notion, um, but not yeah. official MOOC using you know the the various MOOC platforms from edX and Coursera and whatnot. Well, I'm sure there's lots of good information about it elsewhere, but um, I just thought I'd bring that one up and. Yeah, uh, Nancy, did you have other other qu things you wanted to raise with Casey? We're kind of down to our last <clears throat> five or six minutes before we open the survey. Yeah. And I say, like, the MOOCs are super interesting to take a look at. Um, you know, there's a, lev a level of things that is very free and very open, and as I'm sure many people have noticed, there are other ways that people are layering on pay versions. So you, you're paying for a level of certification. You may be paying for the professor actually reading the things you're writing and submitting and level of engagement. Um, so that's another super interesting model to, to consider for sure is, um, is how you can participate on those platforms at those different levels, both totally open and with value added as well. So Casey, I really just, um, I have, um, okay, it's actually two questions, but I'll ask you to answer them together. The first is that we've talked about all these different, um, all these different things that you do but um, overall, I don't want folks to think that, you know, 99% of your budget is getting covered by these very creative revenue generating efforts. I think you'd mentioned to me uh, the relative weight of what the grant funding brings in versus the revenue generation. So just can you just remind us what that split looks like? But the really important part of the question is, what do you think the best balance is? Where would you like to see that split between grants and other revenue generation in the future? Yeah, I, I mean, I think each organization is different. Um, and we're very clear in saying that grant funding is just one of our revenue streams, um, right? And we're starting to generate revenue from memberships <clears throat> um, and some of the products that we offer and, and, and also services we provide. So what's the right mix? I'm not sure. I'd say, you know, 20 percent of our programs are 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 funded through revenue outside of the of federal funding. Um, and certainly we want to we want to get more balance there with that with that percentage. Um, and, you know, and I also I would say that um, I would say that um, the the key for us has just been to experiment. I mean, we've had some wildly spectacular failures in some degree, and I use the term failure. I mean, I, I really mean that. We learned a ton. The the I mentioned the eBooks in our partnership with the, with the publisher, um, and we originally that that strategy was um, we were going to partner with a publisher because they knew how to create textbooks and distribute them and sell them and collect the money. And they could provide some of the instructional resources to support that. And we knew how to develop high quality hands on lab exercises and deliver that virtually. And so we were going to create this partnership and we're going to build out a whole new cloud based pla platform. And we would be $139, would be one transaction. You'd get all of that that I just described. And there was a force reduction by the parent company that owned the publisher that we partnered with. Um, and they laid off. 60 people within the company, including every single person that we were working with on that project. Literally, about three days before we were doing a webinar with about 300 people announcing this, um, and you know, it was, it was, um, it was a mess. And we managed it very well. We were able to manage the communication around that, and you know, and the lesson learned with us is that these relationships can be very fragile, especially the corporate sponsorship relationships. Um, right? Oftentimes, it's you know one person that's a champion for your cause, and if that person goes away and there's no kind of institutional support for the partnership, mm -hmm. those relationships become very precarious. Um, 
but we learned a ton and we learned things like, you know, at the end of the day, we don't really want to be in the ebook business. You know, mm -hmm. our our value prop in the marketplace is is hands on quality information security content, right? And so yeah. as you know, that kind of and that's dipping a valuable lesson. With that publisher that helped us really get clear about that. So I mean, so the takeaway here is that um, it's better to start experimenting than not. And um, and even if your first step is getting Casey on the phone, getting Deidre on the phone, figuring out uh, how to think about her, watching this series of webinars, that's a great start. Deidre reminds us via the chat window that NSF has an intensive, and I do mean intensive, program where NSF actually pays you, uh, your team, to actually go to a very um, uh, rigorous boot camp whereby you do this process of testing the waters, identifying assumptions, figuring out what you need to learn about your customer, and then going and interviewing dozens and dozens and dozens. I think it was as many dozens as it takes to get to the number 100 that right here. <laughs> I think there's actually a really, really uh, a very intensive program. Even if you can't interview 100 potential customers, I would encourage you, if you have any thoughts on some of these ideas, particularly these revenue generation ideas, um, you know, do, do the research you need to do, tee up a couple of key questions, and start getting out there to, to, to test them against uh, the reality. So that brings us to the end of today's programming and to the end of our series this year. Am I right, Rachel? This is our third yes, three. Yes, this is our third webinar. We um, Thanks to everybody who attended. And Mike, if you could go ahead and pop open the survey. Um, the survey is really important to us. It, it helps us do a better job with our webinars, collect some data for NSF. Uh, that link should open in a, in a new window for you in just a second. You should see that come up. Um, you can click on the link there. Mine just opened anyway. Um, we really encourage you to provide us with feedback. Nancy and I always love to, to hear um, from you. Um, we really want to thank Casey for all of his um, great information today. It was really wonderful to have him on uh, our final webinar for the series. And we'll be doing another series of these next spring. So we'd love to hear from you about ideas for, uh, for further content, for future content, too. Thank you to Mike Thanks and his team, too. Thanks to everybody, and I think we can declare this uh, done. Please fill up the survey, and, and have a great rest of your week, everyone. Yes, thank you, Casey, and thank you, Rachel. Take Bye, care. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.